Hi there. In the next series of videos, I want to talk about gradient boosted models. The reason why I want to talk about these models is in part because they are very performant. If you look at Kaggle competitions, it's these kinds of models that tend to win very often on tabular data sets. Part of me also wants to talk about them because there are some uh, features that have been added to scikit-learn to make these models a bit faster, which are interesting to talk about. But most of all, I think it's nice to talk about these models because there are these little details under the hood that do tend to matter. And I think spending a few videos on this topic will actually allow me to go a bit deeper into that. Before we get into all of this though, what I figured I would do for the first video is just briefly explain the intuition behind these gradient boosted models by giving a nice interactive demo in a notebook. So that is what I'll do in this video. All right, so I'm in a Jupyter notebook. Uh, I have some code over here that generates a data set that looks like this. And let's for all intents and purposes say that we're dealing with a regression task and that we are interested in predicting this shape. So we have X that goes into the model and we've got Y uh, that goes out and Y has this uh, interesting shape. Well then, how might you go about modeling this? Well, I could do my best and come up with all sorts of features, maybe do something with splines. That's something I could do. But another thing that I could do is I could also say, well, let's just train a tree-based model on this. And I'm not gonna train the perfect tree. I'm only going to let it go so far in depth. But if I do that, then I might get a output of the tree model that could look something like this. Now, it deserves to be emphasized, I am not making a perfect drawing over here, and the shape that I'm drawing over here definitely will depend on the data as well as some of the hyperparameters that the tree has. But I'm assuming that I've got a decision tree that's not allowed to go super deep. And mainly for illustrative purposes, let's just assume now that this is the tree model output. Well, then you can argue it's pretty good, but it's not necessarily going to be perfect. And we are also making a bunch of errors. Over here, we are undershooting. Over here, we are overshooting a bit. And there are these regions over here that aren't getting any attention whatsoever. And again, that depends a bit on the depth that the decision tree is allowed to go in. But one thing that we could do is we could say, instead of having a tree that goes deeper and deeper and deeper, what we can also maybe do is have a tree after this one. So we could say, this is tree one. This tree makes a error of sorts. And how about I just create a new tree that is going to take this error as input and is going to try to predict that. What would this second tree then try to fit? Well, it would probably zoom in on the bit over here, as well as over here, and maybe the bits over here. This would be a model that would sort of look at the errors that the previous model has made, and it will kind of improve on that. And the interesting thing here is that we can kind of keep on repeating this. This tree is going to be making a prediction, and when I combine it with this tree, then again, I'm going to get an error. And again, I can make another tree, and I can try to have it learn from that. Now, because we are always refitting on these errors, one way of looking at this is that we're kind of using those errors as a gradient, so to say, not unlike uh, what neural networks do. We look at the error that we're making and then we apply another model to sort of learn from those mistakes and also address it. And the hope is that if we just keep on doing this for long enough, that eventually we do get a pretty good model. So let's have a look at what this actually looks like step by step by inspecting some code. All right, so I've got some code over here to help explain step by step how this boosting might work. And the essence of it, is that I've got this function called update where I can give it the predictions that we're making so far, then it will make a new decision tree based on that. And this will update the predictions so far, uh, which is going out of this update function. Let's go through this thing uh, step by step. So the first thing that I'm doing is I'm making a plot and that is just to show the original values that we're trying to predict as well as the predictions so far. Next, I am making another chart, but here I am showing the error that we're making so far. This error is basically the difference between a prediction so far and the actual values, but it's going to be interesting to see these errors 
in the plot because this is the pattern that the decision tree regressor will be learning. And that's happening below over here. Now, you might note that the error so far over here is the prediction so far minus the actual values. But what I'm fitting here is the actual values minus the prediction so far. We'll see in a moment that I'm making this distinction mainly to make this chart look a little bit nicer, but we'll get to that in a bit. The important update thing, though, is happening just below. After I have trained this machine learning model on the errors that we've got so far, I have some new predictions. And those new predictions are going to be added to my prediction so far. That's what's happening here. And at the end over here, I again am making a chart to show what the new local predictions are. So I guess the easiest way to show what is happening is also just to now run this update function. So let's have a look at just that. So what are we seeing here? Well, this first chart is showing the predictions of the global model so far. So all the trees put together, we are predicting zeros for now. That's because we have not trained a tree model just yet. But this is the original data. Then if we think about the error over here, well, in the beginning, we are undershooting. This orange line is below this blue line over here. And that's why we kind of have this negative number over here. When you look at it that way, I do hope it makes sense that the error that we've got so far that that's actually kind of the mirror image of the original line that we've got. Because we're predicting zeros everywhere, effectively we just see something that feels flipped. But okay, uh, we're then going to be attempting a local correction, so to say. So this is the result of the tree-based model. And you can definitely kind of see that it's trying to compensate. It is trying to compensate for this canyon over here by adding a bit of a hill. And when you squint your eyes, hopefully you can also see that the shape that it's coming up with over here is not unlike the shape that we see over here. It's just that the big two hills over here are more pronounced, so those are easy to model. And the stuff that's happening here after, because it's a bit more spiky, um, because the tree model can only go so deep, it is averaging out a bit over there. But okay, so far so good. Let's do another update step. So. What I've now done is I've zoomed out a bit. This is the chart that we just saw. And these charts belong to the second iteration for the second tree, so to say. So again, this first chart shows us the original pattern that we're trying to predict, as well as the prediction so far. And hopefully you can see that this local correction from the previous iteration, well, in this case, we only have one tree. So this directly corresponds with what we see over here. However, the main effect that we can see is that the error so far at this point in time has a completely different shape than before. We are definitely modeling some parts in the beginning over here, and you can see that we're much closer to zero in that beginning bit. But as we get to the last bit over here, this leg, uh, the errors start becoming more pronounced. So hopefully it's also no surprise that if we're gonna train a tree model on this, then this is kind of the shape of the local correction. You can see that there's a big spike up and a spike down, and that actually corresponds with what we're seeing over here. So let's run this again. Now, hopefully for this next iteration, what you can see is that this orange line is receiving this update. And that's actually reflected quite well here. You can clearly see that the orange line fits the entire curve a bit better, mainly because it's able to apply this correction that's learned over here. If we now look at the error though, it now feels like the error is a bit more in the middle of the spectrum, which would correspond to this little canyon over here and maybe the hill over here. And lo and behold, when we train a tree on this error, we see that this is the new local correction. Now at this point in time, we are starting to fit the curve better and better. Even though we are just dealing with trees that can go too deep, we can confirm that if we just apply a new tree to the error so far, that these local corrections can actually make a nice impact. We are fitting this curve closer and closer and closer. So hopefully at this point, there are two aspects of this algorithm that seem very appreciative. One is that uh, we are able to zoom in on a subset of data that's displaying a lot of errors, and we're able to go kind of precise for an update on that. But I also hope that it's clear that every time that we do an update, the correction factor is actually relatively small. We're making a small correction here, a little bit of a change there, and that's because the errors that we're seeing as time moves forward also just become smaller. 
And this becomes very clear if I were just to run this a whole bunch of times. Again, small spiky local correction. Again, small spiky local correction. The errors are going down and down. Let's run this a whole bunch now. We can see that the errors are going down and down and down. And these corrections are becoming slightly more spiky, but also slightly more local. And you can also see at some point we are really fitting this curve quite well. So even though we are dealing with a tree model under the hood that really can't go too deep, the fact that we can apply it over and over again to learn from its previous mistakes, effectively boosting your predictions on every iteration, and it's this main effect, what makes these gradient boosted models, so to say, very powerful and very pragmatic. They have proven to be effective in a bunch of applications, and for a lot of tabular datasets, you can apply them somewhat blindly and get a pretty decent benchmark out. So hopefully the intuition behind this technique is clear by uh, showing this code over here, but there are still lots of details that are worth discussing when it comes to this algorithm. There are a couple of caveats as well as a couple of hyperparameters that do matter. So I'll discuss those in upcoming videos.